yeah. I can see we have lots and lots of delegates joining in as we um, as as we move towards the starting time. So I'd like to to welcome people to this virtual um, mini symposium, a, a panel discussion around the future of tourism and inter alia travel and, and ancillary activities uh, post COVID. And I suppose we are all presuming there will be a post COVID. So this is hosted jointly by the Trinity Business School. I'm Brian Lucy. I am, uh, among other things, the Director of Research of the Trinity Business School. And it's also co-hosted by the Trinity Research and Social Sciences, which is the overarching uh, body for uh, social science research in Trinity. We are uh, delighted to have three panelists who will give us differing experiences and cuts at the, uh, the issue of post-COVID. I suppose the overarching question everybody has is, you know, when will normality for a given level of normality uh, be restored? And, you know, some countries are moving faster than others. The, the pandemic is still going in waves across the globe. And the question of a second or other subsequent waves is still unclear. The question of whether or not there will be a vaccine is still unclear. The question even of the extent to which exposure gives immunity is unclear. But be it as it may, um, we know from other global health emergencies that countries and sectors rebound. We have not had this kind of globalized pandemic in the very hyper-connected globalized world that we had up to the end of 2019. But equally, we have an industry in tourism, and, and I should say I'm not a tourist researcher particularly. I, I do come from a, a, a tourist village, which is there in the background, Waterville County Kerry. Please feel free to visit. Um, stay in my cousin's hotels and guest houses. But, you know, tourism as an industry is globally perhaps up to 10% of GDP. And it's one of those industries which just goes on to some extent in the background. We, we all consume it and it, we take it for granted. So given the importance of that industry, how do we ensure that that industry gets the priority which its size would warrant and deserve? Are the activities and proposals by government uh, the correct ones to do? And to what extent do we have a, um, to what extent do we have a, a, a problem? How deep is the problem and how can we get out of it? Before we start, if I could ask people to go, if they would, on their browsers to www.menti.com, E-N-E-N-T-I. -E I I have a very short, um, a very, very short little questionnaire, which I'll give the results of uh, at the end. If you go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and I'll put that up in the chat. menti.com. And then if you use, it'll ask you to sign in and you have to use the code 183571. That's 18. 35, 71. And there's, you should then see a, a set of um, questions, sliders, to which you can, uh, you, you can provide answers. And I'll give the results of those uh, towards the end of the, uh, towards the end of the conference. Can, I, can everybody see those, that slide? Yes? Okay, great. So if you uh, if you if you if you take your time to um, to just fill in that, and then we will give the results towards the end. Okay, so I'm going to start off now, and we have allocated 15 minutes to each uh, panelist. Uh, and we discussed prior that perhaps 15 minutes is an upper limit because ideally the questions and and maybe the answers are the uh, the more interesting part often of these symposia. I want in particular to thank Brent, who is extending his his, his working day. Uh, towards the evening and uh, Brent is uh, is in Queensland and Denise is in Dublin and Jane is in Edinburgh so we have a truly transcontinental uh, panel to represent a transcontinental phenomena. 
So Denise, if you could uh, just give a very brief introduction to yourself and then share your slides and thoughts, and I'll give you a, I'll, I'll give you a wave when, when time is running out. Thanks, Brian. Um, so my name is Denise O'Leary. I'm Assistant Head of School of Hospitality Management and Tourism in Technological University Dublin. And um, I am going to just share my screen now. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, tourism skills needs and how they may or may not change post-COVID. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, so just to get started here. <clears throat> Essentially, what I'd like to talk about, um, like I say, is the tourism skills needs. I'm going to talk about them in the short term, the medium term and the long term. But as Brian already alluded to, we really don't even know what short term, medium term and long term mean anymore, because that's a movable feast. Um, there it's we have a stop start, probably. Um, <clears throat> re-entry into a post-COVID normal, and it's going to be different for every country, as blanket measures have been replaced by more targeted measures at different times and in different countries. But bearing that in mind, I'm going to talk about um, COVID and post-COVID. But before I do that, I just want to give a little bit of context in terms of the importance of the tourism industry, because it's not always recognised. So in Europe, for example, the EU makes up 3% of the world's surface, but it actually has 40%, it accounts for 40% of the world's inbound tourism. It's the number one tourism destination in the world. And tourism is the third largest economic activity, and it accounts for about 10% of GDP and 10% of total employment. And it's particularly important in regions where there's few alternative sources of employment and income and particularly important to SMEs. And then just to take, for example, one country, uh, Ireland, seeing as Brian said, I am in Dublin. Um, we have approximately a quarter of a million people in Ireland working in the tourism industry, or at least we did have in 2018. And then, that may not seem like a lot until you consider the working population of Ireland is only 2.3 million. So it's a big proportion of that. Um, and then we've had, we have, 11.2 million inter international arrivals in 2018. Again, that may not seem huge in comparison to other countries, but that's into a country where there's a population of only 5 million. But what about COVID? What, the, uh, in, what is the impact of COVID? We don't know yet. Nobody has a crystal ball, but the Restaurant Association of Ireland predicts that there'll be 120,000 jobs lost in the sector in the coming months. Now, permanently, again, is a movable feast. You know, that may change, but that's their, their prediction at the moment. That's a lot when you consider that tourism employs 230,000 people. Um, and then those, the international tourists, how will that change? At the moment, we have 500 passengers a day coming into Dublin Airport. That compares to 100,000 a day normally. It's a huge difference. Um, and then in terms of revenue, we had 6.1 billion in euro in revenue generated in Ireland in 2018. And ITIC, which is the Irish Tourism Industry Confederation, they estimate that there'll be a 3.52 billion in revenue losses. So significant impact. And when you extrapolate that to, at, at, to a world stage, what you're talking about, the predictions are, well, that the predictions are that there'll be a decline in international tourism of 60 to 80 percent, at least in the in the medium term. And there's going to be a loss of nearly a, a thousand billion. It's hard to even say, never mind picture, a loss of a thousand billion as a direct impact of COVID. So huge impacts. So bearing that context in mind, what I'd like to talk about is tourism skills needs. And as part of that, I want to talk about a project that um, we're currently working on in, in TU Dublin. It's called Next Tourism Generation Alliance, and it's a European project, multi-country, multi-partner, and we're looking at tourism skills needs. And one of the things we did before any of us had ever heard of COVID-19 is that we went out and we asked industry providers about 
tourism skills and needs in 2030, what they predicted their skills and needs would be. And interestingly, I haven't shown the current skills and needs, or at least the current, you know, two years ago. They're almost the same, actually. They're, they're not changing a lot. Mm. Now, I'm not going to talk a huge amount about this because I'm going to come back to it later. But just the take home message here is there's a focus on soft skills. There's a, cost, a focus on customers because we are a customer orientated industry. There's a focus on people being able to adapt, be creative, be willing to change, be willing to engage in lifelong learning. And there's also a focus on, yes, customer service, but that height, but an involvement of technology. So high tech with a human touch. So this was before COVID-19. This is what we asked people uh, about a year and a half ago. So in, since COVID-19, so in the previous few months, what we've done is we, Again, there are a lot of industry providers as, who are engaged as part of the project. So we've all been talking, we've been looking at data, we've been engaging with the industry stakeholders across Europe, we've been engaging in things like this in, in um, online discussions. And the sorts of feedback that has come back from industry is that in the short term, businesses are very much focused on how to adapt and prepare for the new normal. So for, an exam for example, in Ireland, we're not there yet. We haven't opened up yet. In some countries, that has happened. And the new normal is consisting of things like screens, sanitization, social distancing, you know, contactless engagement, a reduced staff footprint in indoor areas, PPC, more use of technology apps, you know, designing rotas so that people are not in the same space at the same time. So all of those things, it's a very practical focus. And the focus is still on customer service, but there is a balance there. It's a balance between customer service and ensuring the health and safety of customers. So it's trying to find that balance and trying to, to get it right. That is what's on people's minds at the moment. And one of the things that, that industry is very much focusing on is meeting customer expectations and how to do that. So customers now are you need to instill confidence. They need to know they're safe if they come and they visit your attraction or they stay in your hotel or they engage in some, it, with the industry. Uh, networks are becoming more important. So people are networking more. Now, we're, we were always a highly networked industry in comparison to lots of other industries, but people are finding that's even more important. This is nobody, nobody's ever dealt with anything like this before. So that knowledge that can be gained from engaging with other people is becoming more and more important. There's also a focus on staff trust. So, so staff are putting their health into their employer's hands and into their peers' hands, into the hands of other staff. And they need to be able to trust that they will be healthy and safe. So that's another thing that is really, you know, an impact into, or people are focusing on in terms of the short term. And interestingly, already people are looking at adapting to new customer bases and are actively going out there to seek new customers. So for example, if you're a hotel that depends on conference business or depends on weddings, you, that, that's, there's no future in that in the short term. So you have to go out and, and find a new customer base. So a lot of um, industry providers are doing that. And these are travel agents and tour operators are looking into the possibility of, say, air bridges between specific countries and specific regions. So there's lots of different things that people are looking at and doing. So that's in the short term, because the short term, the focus is on this new normal, um, our short term new normal. In terms of the longer and medium term, people are struggling a bit in terms of how to strategize beyond say 12 months or even beyond three or four months, to be honest, but there is a struggle there. But there is a general consensus that it, we will probably have a more, a more contracted and smaller industry into the future because some businesses are going to close, unfortunately. And as part of that, flexibility and adaptability are becoming more and more important, both, both at a business level and also at a personal level, an employee level. Employees are focusing on their own businesses and on maintaining business resilience. And part of that is developing, as I said, relationships and partnerships beyond their own country, company boundaries. So that's becoming more and more important. 
The domestic market, of course, we all know is more important in the short to medium term because it doesn't look like travel is going to open up anytime soon. Although there is talk, of course, about air bridges and bubbles. But apart from those, it looks like the domestic market is where people are focusing. So either domestic or regional, if they are in continental Europe. Um, flexibility and, as, as I said, adaptability is key. There is a possible cultural change in the definition of working environment. So employers are coming around to the idea of, say, staff who are not necessarily customer facing, who are working in back offices, possibly working more at home, you know, not having to be located in a specific physical space. And I think across the world, that's something that's changing and across all types of sectors. And there's also a possible change in um, customer interaction. So th that's likely to be more virtual and more apps um, in the medium and even into the long-term future. So back to skills needs. So that's the new reality. Those are the sorts of things that that um, industry is thinking about and talking about and planning for. So what about skills? I said that I wanted to look at what the future direction of it, um, for skills needs are. And as a project in NTD, one of the things we're looking at is, do we need to completely change our focus? Were we wrong in focusing what, on what we were focusing on in terms of the skills needs? Well, as it turns out, the feedback is no. Actually, the focus was correct because what employers were always aware of was that soft skills are really important and customer orientation is key in this industry. And that has not changed. So soft skills are still really important. What is becoming more important are those transversal, transferable skills and individual staff members with a multi-skill set. So if, for example, your own business contracts, then, and there's less staff working there, then there's a chance that those staff will have to work across different functions. So they need to be adaptable. They need to have a multi-skill set. There was a focus on unique, customized, personalized experiences in tourism. That's what we were fed. That was, was fed back to us a year and a half ago. That's becoming even more important. There's not going to be the same focus on, you know, 120 people getting into a coach and going somewhere. People want those personalized experiences, especially in the medium term, but then even into the long term as well. Digital knowledge is becoming more important because, as I said, there's a focus now on high tech with the human touch. That was a focus for employers before COVID. It's becoming more and more important. So people are engaging more with apps, either fit, you know, they're engaging more with their customers through the virtual space, obviously, because they can't meet them face to face now. And that will remain important. That's not going to change probably after the whole, after we get back to our normal. Um, and lifelong learning was always a focus and it continues to be a focus. Staff need to be trained to change. So in terms of just, is there anything that has come out of, of those conversations that's a little bit different? Well, yes, I suppose the context that people are talking about in now is the context of crisis management. So health and safety has become more important. But that feeds into that idea of adaptability, um, multiple skill sets, flexibility on the part of employees. Sustainability is also something that came up and it was interesting, there was mixed messages on that. So some people felt we would become more sustainable into the future because you know, the earth has been given the chance to breathe. We've all looked at a different way of operating. But then there was also other messages where people felt they were so focused on keeping their business going that sustainability was taking a back seat. So there was mixed messages on that. Data analytics is coming to the fore more because people don't know what this new world will look like. So one of the things they're doing to engage with uh, new marketing and looking at new customer bases is actually engaging more with big data and data analytics. So that was sort of a new skill set that had appeared, but it's become more important. So I suppose just on the last note, I mean, that's been quite pessimistic. So is there any cause for us optimism? And I suppose there is. I mean, certainly what's come back from businesses is that they're taking the opportunity to train staff, to develop different digital approaches to doing business, to invest in their IT infrastructure, and to focus on different customer bases, not to be stuck in their comfort zone, to actually look outside it. 
And um, I read a, an STR report recently. recently. So STR are um, a big data company that, that uh, report on different sectors, including tourism. And one of the, the areas they're looking at at the moment is China. So they talk about uh, on the 26th of April, there was a 50% difference in occupancy rates from 2019. So there was half, of, there was half less people staying in hotels. Denise, I, I'm going to... I'm going to put, put on my time Nazi hat here. Uh, we, we, I want to try and keep things on time as much as possible. So if we could wind up. That, I had literally one more sentence. Great. <laughs> so the sentence is, um, on the 4th of May then, it was actually, that had changed. It had become a 33% difference. Mm -hmm. So that gap is closing. So China is out there at the moment. They're ahead of us. So if we keep an eye on what's happening there, there is a cause uh, for optimism as occupancy is there is increasing and prices are not dropping. Thank Great. you. Ending on a note of hope, which is important. So I'd like now to pass over to uh, Brent Ritchie uh, from Queensland. And Brent is uh, a very experienced tourism researcher who has very recently been uh, focusing some of his research efforts on crises and how tourist uh, industries respond to and within crises, uh, which is very prescient, of course. So Brent, um, over to you. Thank you again for your time. Thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation. Um, it is, um, if you can see my background, it's not, not sunny, unfortunately, in Queensland right now. It's um, just after 8.20 p.m. Uh, but as Brian said, I'm still up and, and raring to go because this is a, a real crucial, important topic area. Um, so my, my background, as Brian said, I've got a long standing interest in crisis and disaster management for tourism. Um, I did spend some time in the UK um, and around 2001, um, I was researching the foot and mouth outbreak and that sort of interest had piqued my interest in crises and disasters. And from then I've done a lot of work on September 11, SARS and, and GFCs and so on. Um, if, if you are interested in, in some of this area and some of the research findings, there's a couple of books out. Um, the one on the left hand side, I hope you can see that's the Channel View publications book. It's actually free to download. So if you type in Channel View Publications and look at the, the title there, you'll be able to download the book for free. Um, if you're more of an academic, there's a free article here in Annals of Tourism Research, which does a bit of a summary of some of the key, key studies over the last uh, uh, 40 years in the field. So a couple of resources there for you if you're interested um, in the topic area. Uh, in terms of the, the topic, what I want to do is just make some initial observations. And then similar to Denise, I'll talk a little bit about the, the response phase. And I'll talk a little bit then about the longer term recovery. And it's hard to separate these because sometimes the, the lines are a bit blurry. And then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the transformational learning. Are we actually going to learn anything from this? Is there actually going to be any substantial changes uh, in the industry? So in terms of initial observations, as Brian's mentioned, um, post COVID is going to be some time away, I think. I, I can see some glimmers of hope, particularly in Australia and New Zealand and other countries, which have sort of managed to contain the outbreak relatively well. But I think we, we are a little bit worried about additional waves of outbreak, as Brian mentioned. Um, we are heading into our flu season, our winter time, very soon. And we're very concerned about perhaps taking two steps forward and then taking another step back. So we'll have to see how that goes over the coming months. But we are starting to relax some of the um, travel restrictions here in Australia and in Queensland as well. Um, as, as Brian also mentioned, recovery times are going to be staggered. So we're not really going to be able to say that um, world tourism is open until we can actually defeat the pandemic. And that's going to be quite some time away. I think it's really going to be when we get that, um, the vaccinations. And that might be the middle of next year um, or end of this year at the very earliest. But I suspect it's more likely to be middle of next year. Uh, on, on a positive note, 80% um, of tourism is domestic, uh, give or take, and that's quite good. Um, so that means there's a lot of opportunities for domestic tourism moving forward. And uh, also with, with travel restrictions out there, and we've seen a lot of people substituting perhaps their holidays in the next few months for uh, domestic trips. They would normally take international trips. They can't do that now because of travel bans and travel restrictions overseas. So they're looking at holidaying at home. And I think there's some great opportunities for uh, regional tourism. In terms of the impacts, the impacts are not unequal. Um, I think there are some um, industries that are more affected than others. And I think um, 
we've got to realize that a lot of operators are actually small and medium enterprises. We might hear about the bigger end of town, the large tour operators or hotel chains, but the reality is a lot of the operators are actually small and medium enterprises or owner operators. So if we think about the response phase and we think about the available resources that they have, the government's going to need to think about how they target these small and medium enterprises and make sure any, any um, support packages are easy for them to access. Uh, and are not too complicated to, to access. And I think that's an important point. I'll come back to a little bit later. But these small and medium enterprises don't have a lot of money and cash reserves. In terms of the impact I mentioned, airlines and tour operators, particularly the inbound and outbound tour operators are more affected than perhaps retail and hospitality, where there is the ability to pivot a little bit to local markets. And certainly we're seeing that in, in Australia. The hospitality industry is not as badly affected as travel agents. Um, we've also got issues around casualization, um, which um, is a long-standing issue in, in tourism. And this is having an impact in terms of some of the support packages that the Australian government's introduced. Some of the um, casual staff are not actually eligible for those um, job keeper payments um, that we have in Australia. So that's a problem. If people are actually employed on a casual basis for less than 12 months, they can actually access the funding that the government has to support businesses and staff. And I think too, this, um, this issue around the impact on tourism is probably gonna have a longer term impact. I think with students possibly studying tourism and hospitality when they see the impact that this is having, similar to other uh, crises and disasters we've had, we've seen a bit of a downturn in enrolments in vocational and higher education courses. So I think this is a particular issue we need to, to look out for. And obviously too, in terms of the, the impact, it's particularly developing countries who might have a higher percentage of GDP allocated to tourism. I think this is gonna be a potential problem, greater problem for them. And um, they're gonna be a lot more worse off than developed countries, perhaps with a more um, diverse economic base. So those are just a few initial, initial observations. If I turn a little bit to the, the response phase. Um, certainly we know from previous research that targeted relief packages work best for industries most impacted by, by these crises and disasters. Uh, this stage though, because of the impact on a lot of industries, the Australian government has, has basically said if you're impacted in terms of revenue decline, regardless of what industry you're in, you can be eligible for what's called got job keeper payments. And this is about $1,500 a fortnight that's paid to employees, employers who then pass it on to employees. So even if you're in a, a travel agent and you've been stood down from your job or you're an airline, you've been stood down, um, you still get that income coming through $1,500 a fortnight. So it's based on um, your actual decline in, in revenue over a 12 month period. However, some of the, the previous um, examples we've seen in terms of government packages, support packages for tourism, um, have been difficult for, for industry to actually access because they're small and medium enterprises. Um, they often don't have the time and ability to navigate the complex complexities of applying for these, these fundings. Um, we're also seeing perhaps not much in the way of marketing at the moment. There's really no, no reason to be marketing except for trying to put your destination in people's minds, to have top of mind awareness. And we're seeing a little bit of that in terms of social media. As an example, here with, uh, with Netherlands, around dream now and visit us later. Uh, and we're also seeing that with UNWTO, hashtag travel tomorrow. So in terms of campaigns, there's no point in really running campaigns until uh, the pandemic is defeated. So really at this stage, it's about top of mind marketing, so using social media and public relations activities. It's perhaps looking at tracking consumer sentiment and trying to get an understanding of whether there are going to be particular market segments that are more likely to come back quicker. And then starting to perhaps look at the visiting friends and relatives market. So in some of uh, our previous research regarding disasters and crises, we've actually found that um, visiting friends and relatives market is actually quite a, a robust market. They're more familiar with the destinations, particularly regional destinations. They're more willing to travel and they have connections uh, in these domestic locations. So they're often talking to the people about what's actually going on. I think that's obviously a key, a key market segment moving forward. So that market intelligence, that tracking of consumer sentiment is pretty crucial and, and it goes on from the response phase right through 
the recovery marketing. Here in Australia, we're seeing some local travel. We've now allowed to go from 50 kilometers traveling, day trips, to now 150 kilometers in Queensland. We're not yet allowed to stay overnight. Um, I understand that's coming in around mid-June. We'll be allowed to actually have an overnight stay uh, of up to 150 kilometers. But we're seeing some of the states and territories lifting restrictions across border travel, but Queensland is resisting a little bit. Um, and not planning on opening interstate travel until September. So there's a little bit of conflict going on between the states and territories in Australia. Um, so Queensland's being quite cautious, not, not opening uh, for cross-border travel until um, September. And as Denise mentioned too, at this stage, people are quite concerned about health protocols and so on. And we're seeing some of the industry associations and the peak lobby uh, groups like WTTC coming out with uh, procedures and, and plans and templates to help businesses think about those health protocols and to get plans in place so that when restrictions are uh, lifted, they're able to have plans in place and actually um, take, take guests. So that's the res response phase. If we move into a little bit the, the long-term recovery phase, as, as Brian said earlier, we do know tourism is pretty resilient. It does bounce back pretty quickly. But I think this particular event is um, unprecedented. And I think the impact globally is, is gonna mean that slow recovery. Um, just on the right hand side, you might not be able to see this too clearly, but there's been some modeling done for, for PARTA, Pacific Asia Travel Association. And this is just showing the US and visitor arrivals to Asia Pacific as a whole. And the blue line is really the, the um, projections from 2020 onwards. And then what we've got is actually scenarios around recovery. So that was what they expected before COVID. And then you see some V-shaped recovery. But the, the pessimistic um, scenario says we're not going to get back till quarter two, 2022. So the US market traveling to Asia Pacific is not going to get back to where it should be uh, until quarter two, 2022. And that's a 24% reduction and visitor arrival numbers to Asia Pacific. The most likely scenario is around quarter three, 2021, and that's a drop of around 17%. The optimistic scenario is quarter one, 2021 return and about 10% reduction. So we, we really are in for a bit of a slow recovery, I suspect. Um, in terms of consumer motives, it's really important to understand that and preferences, as, and Denise has mentioned this too, around uh, health and hygiene, that's gonna be pretty crucial. But also some of our work domestically, some of my colleagues are finding that even Australians, only around 50% want to travel domestically once restrictions are open. So there's a little bit of hesitation around traveling even domestically that we're seeing and some of the data that we're collecting. We've also some, collected some data in China and we're also seeing some of these similar trends. People are quite anxious, they're a little bit frightened about travel and it seems to be more around domestic travel, traveling by car, traveling independently um, and concerned around taking public transport or traveling in groups. So I think this could persist for a little bit of time until we get, get over the, the pandemic. Uh, I, I can see some uh, possibilities around cross-border um, or cross-country corridors. Um, we may have relationships with countries with low cases. There's a bit of a um, story going around around um, New Zealand and, and Australia having a trans-Tasman bubble because we both have quite low numbers of cases. So there's potential for uh, transport between New Zealand and Australia. And we're thinking that that might actually happen around October this year. So for countries where there are low cases, we might be able to have visas and open up uh, restrictions for travel. I think too, we're gonna see more cooperative marketing because the, the dollars for marketing are gonna be smaller. I don't think states and territories are able to actually um, perhaps compete with each other. They're gonna have to cooperate together. And I can see more public and private partnerships in terms of marketing and the longer term recovery, focusing on higher yield markets. Um, I won't say anything about events as a catalyst. I think Jane might touch on this, but often events are the catalyst for recovery after a crisis or a disaster. But I think with the nature of COVID, it's a bit challenging to do that. And I have got some concerns about tourism, and hospitality careers and career paths, considering um, the decline in tourism and, and its impact on tourism. We're going to see fewer 
students, I think, enrolling in university study. And just finally, Denise mentioned business networks and the roles, the role of associations. What we're seeing is a lot of members are quitting associations because it costs money. Right when they actually need the networks, right when they need the support, they're withdrawing their support because they can't financially afford it. So I'm a little bit worried about what that might, uh, the impact that might have on, on um, business networks and support mechanisms uh, through industry associations. Just, just finishing up, um, in terms of transformation learning, there's a lot of um, talk and a little bit of rhetoric around building back better. And I, I think this particular uh, comment here from the UNWTO about providing stimulus packages that can also transform the industry is very laudable. It's, it's very aspirational, but I, I don't think that's really translating. When we see some of the government packages, it's all about getting the businesses up and running. It's not about helping them to transform or change their practices. So we're seeing some bailouts of airlines, we're seeing some support of airlines, but we're not necessarily seeing that tied to carbon efficiency or reduction in emissions and so on. So I think that that opportunity is perhaps um, um, lost a little bit because we're so so much focused on getting businesses back to, to normal. There are though, as, as Denise has said, there are innovative things going on in the industry. We need to keep those things going. Um, we have a tendency to perhaps at this stage, at the end, when uh, we're coming out the other side of a pandemic to think about the market or supply chain dependencies, think about our vulnerabilities and how to reduce those moving forward. Perhaps there's some good practices we've made. We've maybe changed products or pivoted to new markets where you need to keep that going. And also planning for these kind of black swan events. Often we don't have that, that actually happening. We, we tend to plan for a high likelihood, but low impact events. So I think there are, can be some positives that we can take from this. Um, but often uh, it's, it's very difficult when you're trying to save jobs uh, and save livelihoods that these things often are put on the back burner. So thanks for the opportunity for sharing some of my, my insights and ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Brent. So um, a certain amount of, uh, a, a certain amount of, again, of light at the end of a, a tunnel, which is, looks like it's going to be 12 to 16, 18 months uh, would be the median from what you're suggesting there. Now, you mentioned about events and uh, Jane Alley Knight, thank you, Jane, for joining us. Uh, you're going to, I think, give some very interesting perspectives from a city which has an enormous events business, uh, the Edinburgh Festival, of course, and its associated activities. Uh, so Jane is at uh, Edinburgh Napier University and is professor of events management there and will, I think, give us, um, give us an insight that's uh, perhaps narrow but very deep. Uh, and as we see, events may be a, a, driving, a driving force forward. So Jane, over to you. Thank you again for your attendance. Okay, thank you. So uh, good morning, uh, everybody, from actually a sunny Edinburgh today, which is uh, unusual. So can everybody see my screen? Yep. Yeah, okay. All right. So I think uh, the two previous presentations were really interesting uh, and I can draw a lot of parallels in terms of what's happening here in Scotland. Uh, I mean, I think like Dublin, we've got a very strong domestic and UK market, which is obviously important going forward. We're also seeing conflict in terms of like Australia within the uh, different countries within the UK. I mean, Scotland's approach has been very cautious. We're still in quite strict uh, lockdown uh, conditions till uh, tomorrow. And again, our industry bodies are really leading uh, the recovery uh, going forward. Uh, and I think because of the devolved nature of our government, we have got very close links to, for example, our tourism minister. And I think they're finally realising the value of tourism uh, to Scotland, which is uh, great. So what I'm going to talk about is, uh, yeah, I can echo a lot of what's been said in the previous presentations in terms of the approach being taken here in Scotland. But I'm going to focus on, obviously, in terms of Edinburgh, 
and just some thoughts really uh, from the festival city. So as you can see, the picture on my screen here is Hogmanay. So this is probably one of the last big events uh, we held here in Edinburgh. That was our New Year's Eve uh, celebration. And I suppose even now there's doubts over whether we'll be able to do that in that format uh, this 2020 uh, New Year, because as you can see, uh, we've got thousands of people congregating in a public space, which I think is going to change uh, going forward. So uh, obviously, uh, festival and events are a key sector uh, in Edinburgh. Uh, they're an economic powerhouse. Uh, the festivals uh, alone in the latest research are shown to bring in up to thir £300 million into the Edinburgh economy and over 300 to the wider Scottish economy. Uh, and also, in going back to what Denise was talking about, they also provide lots of jobs. So uh, 6,000 FTEs. Uh, and again, in terms of thinking of sort of universities and skills, a lot of those uh, sort of casual jobs would go to uh, students and then obviously graduates going forward. So uh, there's no doubt as to the importance of festival events to Scotland and in particular to Edinburgh as uh, a festival city. So uh, obviously 23rd of March, uh, the government uh, put an immediate stop to public gatherings. So that's had a huge effect on the industry here. Uh, so straight away, over 130 events uh, were cancelled and postponed. And obviously they range from cultural festivals, sporting events, business events. And obviously that's placed significant challenges on the industry. I mean, obviously we have got industry support packages in place, similar to what there are in Ireland and in Australia. Uh, but again, there's doubts over how long they're going to continue for. And obviously uh, the fact that events and tourism are probably going to be one of the last industries to recover. So obviously we've had some high profile casualties. Uh, the SSE Hydro in Glasgow is a music venue predominantly. I think it's the second biggest in Europe. That's been closed for two months. Uh, we were due to host some of the UEFA uh, European Football Championships in Glasgow, which has again uh, been postponed. So initial uh, research that was conducted uh, at the beginning of COVID showed that uh, basically uh, employees were having to dramatically reduce uh, staff numbers uh, and also suffering significant financial impacts for events that haven't happened uh, in excess of over 100,000 for some instances. So Events Scotland, which are our public sector body linked to government and part of Visit Scotland, uh, have been offering guidance and support to the industry, uh, predominantly about event cancellation initially and how to communicate with audiences, suppliers and participants. However, they've recently uh, done a series of virtual forums uh, with key sort of people across the sector to look at what are the key issues and challenges. And I'm going to just talk a little bit about them. So what is interesting is that I actually attended one of those forums and the forum that I attended did had uh, somebody who ran the Space Side Whiskey Festival. It had a guy from the association that run Highland Games. It had somebody who ran the mountain bike championships again in the Highlands and also one of the key promoters from the Edinburgh Festival Fringe and me sort of representing education. So I think there we have the complete diversity of the industry, which poses a huge challenge in terms of this really sort of no one size fits all approach that can be taken going forward for uh, many events. So this has literally just come out in the last few days. Uh, and I think there's some interesting sort of takeaways there. I've just sort of taken some of the key sort of headlines. Uh, but I think one of the key things is that we cannot deliver events in the way we've been doing it in the past for the foreseeable uh, future. 
Uh, future funding will need to change uh, to reflect the changed environment and we're not going to be able to deliver uh, events on the same scale. So I've listened to some really interesting podcasts, particularly uh, for a lot of outdoor events. Uh, and they're saying that those huge sort of public events just aren't going to happen sort of anytime soon. Obviously, festival organisers are in particularly those that are more commercially focused are in huge problems uh, and they've got uh, a reduced appetite for commercial uh, risk. Uh, what we do need is we need guidelines, timescales and clarity over what the phase reintroduction of math gatherings is going to look like and obviously we need a resurrection of the supply chain uh, which is critical for that recovery and uh, delivery and obviously we need to work with other parts of the tourism sector you know so events rely heavily on accommodation on transport so all these sectors need to be speaking to each other uh, lots of events are having huge cash flow problems uh, insurance going forward as you can see there is increasing by 700 uh, percent so there's a lobbying government at the moment to try and support and underwrite that uh, Denise talked about workforce so yeah we do obviously need an expert workforce to restart the sector but at the moment the majority of people I know working in events are furloughed uh, and there's lots of discussion of uh, redundancy and events sort of being cancelled and never happening again going forward. Again yeah need for clear and consistent health and safety advance and a coordinated industry voice. And I think uh, we're quite lucky in Scotland that we're doing that at the moment. Uh, and also, yeah, the importance of research. So I've literally just got some funding for a research project with Edinburgh University, where we're going to be working with some uh, sort of data uh, scientists and data analysts and crowd modelers looking at what events would look like if we have to actually deliver them under social uh, restrictions, social distancing restrictions going forward. So uh, going back to Edinburgh then, so these are our key 11 festivals. Obviously there are many, many festival events that happen in Edinburgh, but in terms of festivals Edinburgh, these are the 11 uh, key festivals that happen every year. And as you can see, the ones that have been hit uh, are obviously our summer festivals, uh, and also, I think the science festival was just about to start when we went into COVID. So really, the only festival, uh, we haven't had any of the Edinburgh festivals this year so far, and I think it's unlikely that any of them will happen. Uh, so yeah, so this was uh, the sort of breaking news on the 1st of April, uh, when they announced that for the first time in over 70 years, uh, the five key summer festivals wouldn't be happening uh, and yeah the cancellation was felt not just in the city but also around the world uh, so as it said there it felt like they were cancelling uh, Christmas so the five August festivals then uh, compromise over 5,000 events across Scotland's capital uh, and they welcome an audience of 4.4 million and I think what is important is that a lot of that audience however is domestic and is UK so although a lot of the artists may be uh, international and the performers, we do still have a very strong domestic market for the festival. And also the majority of people probably go within a 10 mile radius of uh, Edinburgh. And there's some quotes there from some of the festival directors, uh, which basically shows that the reason for cancelling was obviously prioritising safety again, in terms of safety of the audiences, the artists, and also those working to combat uh, coronavirus. Uh, so a question obviously uh, has been raised in terms of how will those festivals innovate, develop, and ultimately survive in a post-COVID world? So this was an interesting article that came out a few weeks after the uh, announcement where Fergus Linehan, who's the director of the Edinburgh International Festival, which is our sort of traditional high arts uh, festival, although Fergus has really changed that festival in terms of making it much more accessible, inclusive and contemporary. Uh, and he said a really interesting thing that he said it's time, which I suppose has been controversial and contentious, it's time to end the never ending growth 
uh, and reconnect with the people of Edinburgh. And I think that goes not just to the international festival, but across the whole sort of festival events and tourism sector and links back to what Denise and Brent were both saying in terms of uh, sustainability. So we need to deliver more sustainable festivals and not sustainable just in terms of the economy, but also sustainable in terms of the local community and also the cultural, social uh, impacts of the festivals and also the financial model itself will need to be more uh, sustainable. So I think that was a really sort of interesting article uh, that made people really start to think how can we deliver uh, going forward. Uh, then what I've looked at is I've looked at obviously some of the positives and the negatives and I think uh, I've done a few sort of media things and one of the key things I keep saying is that what this has shown is there's been a lot of negative press about the festivals in the last couple of years in terms of they're too big, obviously their environmental impacts, uh, the lack of connection with the local community. But I think the one thing that will come out of this is the realisation of the value of festivals in terms of what they bring, uh, not just to a destination, whether that's uh, economic, but also to the fabric of society. You know, that within society, there is a desire to meet and come together and share practice and ideology and festivals are a key way of doing this. Uh, however, you know, there are many, many festivals. I think there's over a thousand music festivals that happen every year in the UK. Uh, I mean, that's obviously too many. And what will people need to do uh, to survive and what support can they be given? I think we're going to see, and this is obviously happening today is a good example of this. There's a move to more digital and virtual events. Some really interesting things been happening in terms of live streaming. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's obviously not the same, but I think uh, there's been some really innovative uh, events uh, being shown online. And obviously I think this will continue even when we are allowed to meet together as well. Uh, I've talked before about funding and I think this is key. You know, particularly those big public events, they're going to need more realistic funding patterns. And also, uh, going back to what Fergus was discussing, we need more innovative festival delivery models. And also we need a different imagining of the festival space and how we use that space. And I suppose that's what the project I'm working at at the moment uh, is looking at. Uh, so obviously, uh, you know, it's not all good news. And uh, as we've said, festival events will be one of the last to recover because of the nature of their delivery and the issues around crowded space and obviously uh, the social distancing requirements. Many cancel festivals will never return. Uh, probably the last time we saw this was 2012 when we had a really, it was the year of the Olympics uh, and we also had a really wet summer and lots of events were cancelled then because of weather. And a lot of those uh, never uh, returned. So uh, also, as I've said er earlier, the impact of major events has been under growing scrutiny uh, amid concerns over rising tourism numbers, crowd congestions and the commercialization of public space. So I think that debate is going to continue and hopefully we're going to get some good ideas going forward of how we can deliver more sustainable events that link closer to the local community. Uh, so I'm just going to end with uh, a picture of Edinburgh. So this, for those of you who have visited, is uh, the Royal Mile, sort of in festival time. So as you can see, uh, many, many people uh, on the street. Uh, and interestingly, I actually walked down the Royal Mile uh, only a few days ago, and it was absolutely empty. Uh, there wasn't one single person uh, walking down the road. Uh, and obviously at this time, we would be very, very busy. Uh, but however, festivals are important. They're a key part of our society. And I'd just like to end with uh, this quote, which says, festivals influence people's idea of a city. At their best, they culminate in a festival moment, a powerful experience bringing together audience and festivals, performers and organisers. So I hope that in the not too distant future, we will be able to have some of those festival moments again. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Denise.
So we have, we have a few minutes. Uh, we, we don't have to end exactly on 11. People may have, uh, may, may have time, but we won't go too long. Um, first of all, let me share, if I may, the um, results of, of the questionnaire to which people were so kind to answer. Um, I will just put this up here now, if I can share screen. Um, so we had um, before questions, and it, it seems as though people are not particularly confident in the government strategy. There is, uh, to me, quite a surprising uh, degree of agreement that the proposal for a quarantine, in, inbound quarantine, is proportionate. Uh, very much on the fence about 2019, uh, within two years. And um, I suppose echoing the pandemic, the quarantine question, people are um, not very enthused, although it's very bimodal. Uh, people are strongly of the view that either we should or we should not uh, look to other countries in, in terms of reopening for international tourism in June. So I think those are some interesting findings that, uh, that, that, that contextualize where we are. We have a bunch of questions. Some of them are quite technical. Some of them are quite specific. But if I could, maybe just one question with a request for a, a relatively short answer to each of the people. Jane, you, you have, um, you've been saying there that events are, are a key driver and, and Brent has also said this. And you say it's, it's going to be, you know, some time before we get back to this. There are a few questions around events and the visiting friends and relatives type market. As I read the questions, I suppose the summary I would take is, how can governments boost this? If these are the drivers, if these are a key driver, and yet they're going to be at the back end of any recovery, you know, what specific issues can be done to try and move this forward, this engine forward? Yeah, well, I think it's really difficult. It's really challenging uh, just because of the nature of how we deliver events. So I think, um, you know, thinking about, I suppose, indoor events, first of all, events that take place in venues, you know, there's lots of work being done around how can you do that under social distancing measures. And I think what we're going to see is hybrid events going forward. We're going to see some events happening as in face to face. But I think almost that's going to be a premium. Because if you go into, uh, for example, say you're going to see a concert in a venue and we're doing that under social distancing restrictions, there's going to be, I think it's something like a 20% uh, in the amount of people that can be in that venue. So then we're going to see, that's almost like a premium experience because you're going to be very up close and personal with the artist. And then we're probably going to see that being live streamed to another audience as well, which again could be monetized. I mean, it hasn't been to date, but it is going to have to be going forward. Uh, outdoor events, obviously, uh, are more challenging, but then the COVID restrictions aren't as tight uh, when we go to the outdoors. So I think you know, there's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of how we can deliver those events. I think the key thing is a lot of it will probably stay online uh, initially. But I know festival and events are doing a lot of work in terms of keeping in touch with their audiences, uh, talking to their audiences in terms of, you know, what they want uh, and how soon they, they would feel comfortable. Because a lot of it, again, is going back to that consumer behaviour, you know, and uh, a lot of the research at the moment is showing that, you know, people wouldn't necessarily be that confident going out to uh, see a concert or going to an outdoor event. Uh, Denise, can I, there's a couple of questions which revolve around specific job issues, but there's another uh, set of questions which I guess is around uh, the skills. And I think that picks up on the issue of personalised and tailored issues. You addressed this to some extent in terms of what you were saying in relation to the skill sets. And I guess the, um, the, the questions seem to revolve around what do you see as being perhaps the, uh, if I could rephrase them, what would you see as being the in-demand uh, tourist and hospitality related jobs you know, next year when we get to some degree of, or towards some degree of normality? Where, where do you think the growth areas are going to be and where are the ones that are going to be really problematic? 
Um, well, I, I do think that, again, none of us have a crystal ball, but anything that involves lots of people together in a space, obviously, you know, that's an obvious one is going to be a difficulty. So certainly the, the talk from the event industry is there's, there's a real challenge there. And as Jane was saying, um, you know, there is, there is a sort of focus on using events almost as a marketing strategy for forward marketing into the future. Um, restaurants, uh, hotel, any pubs, any of those spaces are struggling at the moment in terms of how to engage with social distancing and other restrictions. But people are being quite innovative in what they're doing and, you know, and making use of outdoor spaces, etc. So I'm not sure that, you know, there's certain sectors that will do better than others and that it's easier to actually um, you know, it, look at the restrictions. So say, for example, big outdoor spaces like visitor attractions. I mean, I showed a picture there of Knossos, you know, yeah. it's, it's a lot easier to, to apply those restrictions in, in one of those types of spaces. It's a lot more difficult when you're talking about a tight space indoors. So that in a way is going to be the defining factor is how easy it is to actually impose the restrictions in that particular space. But again, that's only the short term, Brian. You know, people are, are seeing that things will open up again. I mean, I've, I've talked to some hoteliers in Spain recently and they basically said, you know what, in a couple of years, this will seem like a bad memory. So I think we have to hold on to that too. Yeah, I think that's, that, that's quite an interesting one because there was an interesting report in The Guardian today, um, outing myself as a Guardian reader, that um, this lady was in uh, a very popular tourist destination in New Zealand and at eight o'clock everybody was being super cautious social distancing sitting at the bar at the tables you know, by 10 o'clock you know, everything was just back to what looked like a normal Friday night out in the town uh, human beings are social animals and you know, that's uh, that, that that's I think that's the thing we need to hang on to Brent if I, if I can leave you with the uh, if I can leave the, the conference with, with with a last question which is maybe a double header to you so we have a crisis and industry, government, all actors, academics are responding to it. It picks up a little bit on what Denise is saying there. So the first part of the question is, how can you get people to think strategically uh, in a crisis? I mean, it's always an issue with regard to what any crisis, whether it's financial or, or personal, but how do you get people to think? How do you incentivize uh, governments and industry actors to think beyond the immediate, think to where we're going to be in the, uh, in, in, in the future. And the second part of it, I guess, is as in so many ways, if we look at China, we see a future. It may not be the future we want or desire, but it's a future. And the Chinese inbound and the Chinese outbound tourist experience is picking back up at perhaps, uh, when you think of the problems they had, quite a remarkable pace. So you see the pessimistic and optimistic scenarios there, um, but is there a potential for a more rapid rebound than we thought? Whether that's through a, vir a, a vaccine or people just going, yeah, you know, people are social and the Black Death didn't, uh, didn't stop travel, so why will this? This is not to, you know, not to downplay the seriousness of this disease, but it is something that is there and will be there forever and we have to deal with it medically or socially. So a strategic, I suppose two strategic questions, one about uh, the, the wisdom or foolishness of crowds and one about you know, how you deal with policy making. Yeah, I think it's hard in terms of incentivizing industry. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of them are small and, and micro businesses. So planning for events that might not eventuate is very, very difficult. Um, but, but I think that's important to think through and, and say, well, what could happen, what if? And, and do some kind of scenario planning at, at an individual business unit level, as an industry association level. I think that's probably got more merit and more possibilities there with industry associations taking the lead, and working with their members to do that with them. I think it's very, very difficult with, um, you know, if you're an owner operator to actually start to think about these kinds of things. You might not have the knowledge and skills and expertise and all the time and money. So I think there is a real role for industry associations to bring the members along work through them um, with, with their crisis management plans and think through this. The other thing is maybe insurance rebates. Insurance companies should be looking at 
seeing if these things exist. Do the businesses have crisis management plans? Do you offer some kind of, of rebate or incentive reduction in their premiums? I think that might be one way to change the behaviour, but it's very, very difficult. I mean, we, we have had um, these plans in, in Australia at a national level, but they haven't been refreshed for a number of years. So I expect now after this, there'll be a rethink and a, and a readjustment to the national level plans. But with, with tourism businesses, it's very, very difficult for them to get, in, to get them to think about beyond next week, let alone you know, in a year or so. In terms of the, the Chinese outbound market, I mean, we have done some research in that market over March. Granted it was March, but we, we asked about um, travel restrictions lifting and I've got to say there is a, is a particular segment that um, are less fearful about travel and they are more willing to travel internationally um, but overall most of the respondents and that's about 1200 across China most respondents actually do want domestic holidays. they want short local trips and the number that want uh, international trips even when restrictions are lifted are only around 10% um, and that's about 5% for the high fear group that we indicate we found a group that was quite fearful. About 5% would travel internationally. And those that had less fear were only about 10% would travel internationally. So I think there is a bit of anxiety and a bit of concern around particularly international travel. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're over our time, but that's fine. We've had a really interesting sets of, uh, set, set, sets of presentations. I want to thank again our presenters. Um, I want to thank the Trinity Research in Social Sciences for hosting this discussion. Uh, there's lots and lots of questions and lots and lots of issues. We could spend a very long time here. This is part of TCD's uh, response towards uh, COVID. And of course, we're in a brave new world and we're all trying to grapple with how we, uh, how we deal with things virtually, uh, events or conferences, etc. Uh, this is part of that reaction. Thank you again. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all the questions, but I think the questions that I was able to ask there gave a flavour of the concerns people have. And uh, again, thank you very much indeed. And we will now finish up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Brent. Thanks, Brent. Thanks, Brent.